everyone, mate. Over to you, whenever you want to start. The recording's already started, mate. Thank you. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, I've met everyone here today now, but uh, as we're in 2022, uh, um, hi to everyone who's watching on Catch Up um, and on my YouTube channel. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, to be invited here today to talk to you all about a subject that I'm really passionate about, which is coaching neurodiversity and me. So, uh, yeah, this is, we're going to have uh, some interesting conversations. I'm going to share with you some of insights about myself. Uh, and one thing that I hope that you're able to take away from today is uh, I'm able to provide some education, some information and some inspiration around neurodiversity. So a little bit about me. Um, so I'm an award-winning Neurodivergent Coaching Leader of the Year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. HR, people, organizational development specialist, uh, entrepreneur, founder, and director of Be Brilliant People Development. Uh, my primary area of focus and concern is around neurodiversity. I specialize in helping organizations build neuro-inclusive workplace cultures uh, and empowering and enabling neurodivergent talent in the workplace. I fuse lived experience of being neurodivergent with over 20 plus years background and leadership experience in business, HR and people and organizational development. I'm extremely passionate about helping people achieve their potential and to be their authentic selves, regardless of background and challenges. I'm committed to educating and raising the profile and awareness of neurodiversity in the corporate space and beyond. I'm also a neurodivergent myself. Um, I'm an executive coach and mentor, champion, activist, speaker and poet. I know we've got another poet in the audience today. Blogger and podcaster. Uh, I also host the Be Brilliant People podcast. Yeah, what's well, uh click is not working, but don't worry. I'll do it manually. <laughs> don't worry. Thank you for rushing to the uh, that aid there, my very able assistant there. I'm not quite sure that you knew that you was my assistant yep. there, but thank you very much. So, we adapt. Yeah, no, we do. So a little bit about kind of my mission statement um, at Be Brilliant People Development, and it's to support the development of growth and growth of neuroinclusion and neurodivergent talent in the workplace. That is what I'm all about. That is what I do. That is what I live and breathe. So... The bee doesn't know he can't fly, but does it anyway. So the bee represents the unique individuality of people and my approach to coaching and supporting both the development of people and organisational workplace cultures. As I said, the bee doesn't know he can't fly, but he does it anyway. Now, for me, that's a metaphor for, la uh, for life around being neurodivergent and believing in and being your authentic self. You can only do that if you're able to be your authentic self, not the bees and the amount of times I use bee in this presentation today. In the neurodivergent community, we often wear masks and that can mean different things to different people depending on their lived experience. And having masked myself for the majority of my adult life, uh, I'm becoming very good at it, becoming a chameleon, I might say. From lived experience, I actually know what happens when you're not able to live your life in a way that is not authentic with who you are as a person, nor is it aligned with your values and your purpose. So I believe that having that alignment and purpose enables us to, as human beings, actually, to, to live our best lives, achieve our dreams, goals and purpose in life and also in our careers. And if you apply that to an organisational, cultural context, watch as amazing things start to happen. The clicker is definitely not working now. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, 
this is me and this is a little bit of a, a journey which I'm, I'm going to share with you all. Um, you can actually see there where it all sort of started and where it's led to as well. Um, it's fair to say that I struggled in mainstream education. I bombed out with no qualifications and not many prospects really I would say. Um, there wasn't really much in the way of recognition or support for anyone who thought differently. Simply put, you conformed or you were alienated. Uh, my school reports talked about me being a dreamer quite a lot. Uh, they also said I was unable to sit still, can't focus, lacks concentration, needs to improve spelling. You can see how I lacked confidence and thought that education wasn't for people like me. Neurodivergents don't want pity. We don't want to be treated as inferior. We simply want the support that we need and deserve to harness our unique perspective and diversity of thought and thinking. So I went, sorry, I'm going to move back. It is working. You showed me it was working, didn't you? I went from zero education and essentially being a dropout to a successful career um, in the UK civil service, um, returning to education through the workplace, actually, not through mainstream education, although I did end up working in the Department for Education. Um, go figure. Uh, achieving all manner of professional qualifications from business to HR to coaching where is where I found my true calling I then went on to establish my own business um, focused on fusing my two passions so coaching and harnessing the power of neurodivergent thinking in the workplace and I was delighted to be named the coaching leader of the year 2022 by my professional peers and I might add also another thing that I'm really proud about is the first neurodivergent coaching leader of the year, which I am incredibly proud about. There we go. So show of hands, and for those who are watching on, the, on video, you might not be able to see this, but I can give you some kind of indication. Has anyone kind of heard of the term neurodiversity before? Put your hand up if you have. Fantastic. That's a great start. And it wouldn't matter if you hadn't as well, because part of my ethos is around educate as well. Um, but a little bit of education around neurodiversity for those who maybe don't know um, is neurodiversity as a concept uh, was first coined in 1998 by an Australian sociologist called Judy Singer. Now the word neurodiversity itself describes the idea that there are many ways to think, learn and behave. But let's break that down a little bit further uh, and explore some of the language and terminology um, that you can see here that's used in this space. So, for example, neurotypical, neurodivergent with the umbrella term neurodiversity. So if we focus on neurotypical, um, first of all, well, neurotypical describes around 60% of the population. Um, so individuals whose brain develops and functions in ways that are considered normal uh, or expected by society. Neurodivergent uh, describes the remaining 40% of society who think and act differently to what society perceives as normal. Neurodivergence covers a multitude of co-occurring differences. For example, and this is not exhaustive, ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, autism, Asperger's, Tourette's, and more. Autism, or Autistic Spectrum Disorder, ASD, is a spectrum um, 
co-occurring difference um, or difference that affects people in different ways. And like all people, um, autistic people have their own strengths and weaknesses. So, for example, people with ASD may also be dyslexic or have ADHD or a mix of all or vice versa. There's lots of overlap um, between neurodivergent conditions. I myself uh, have ADHD, dyslexia and dyscalculia, so a heady mix. And what I like to describe as neurospiciness. <laughs> Neurodivergent conditions are a protected characteristic, of course. And people with uh, neurodivergent conditions are defined legally as being disabled people for the purposes of the Equality Act 2010. And that's important context, I think, to understand, uh, particularly if you're in a role where you are working with people or potentially working with neurodivergent people. That could be as a manager, as a leader, as a coach, to ensure that not only are you legally compliant, but also to ensure that you, you're practicing ethically and that you're not discriminating against anyone. You're also operating from a position of fairness and equality and inclusion. And you're creating a truly neuro-inclusive experience for people. Mike, just a quick question on that. Of course. Do you have to have, a, have, to have a, an actual diagnostic so it's for, for you to be part of that uh, protected characteristic? No, okay. is the answer to that. You can, can self-identify. If you want to self-identify, you don't. And, and indeed, it's often quite difficult to get a diagnosis as well. So for example, if you were to seek a diagnosis around ADHD, for example, that has to go through a medical route. And that can take, at the moment, I've heard minimum two years to get a diagnosis. Might be other options if you can pay privately, um, but again, it's, it's a long process. And not everybody wants to go through that process either so yes you can completely self-identify because there's more knowledge and awareness now around what neurodiversity is and you can recognize those within yourself how that might be actually you and hopefully today this might actually help with with some of that as well uh, and some takeaways for people but no you don't need a, a diagnosis um, and there's a huge debate actually around people whether people want to or need to have a diagnosis um, as well my personal view on it is it's beneficial uh, in terms of within the workplace context and getting the adjustments and support that you need and still at the moment we've not got to an enlightened place where you know everyone can kind of identify and actually we don't really need labels so we'll just provide an inclusive environment where everyone gets what they need that's the that's the kind of dream the nirvana but we're, we're a long way off that i have to be completely honest with that so from that perspective it's helpful to have a diagnosis but that's personal choice you don't you don't have to have a diagnosis is that helpful did that answer yeah, your question yeah, yeah thank you good <laughs> this is an interesting one i wanted to share with you and Again, a show of hands of people heard about intersectionality. Oh, it's an interesting, interesting mix. So for the benefit of people watching on the video recording, probably uh, is a low minority of people that raised their hands in terms of that question, and that's an interesting response as well. But meet Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, for those who have not heard of Kimberly Crenshaw. She's a 60-year-old American uh, lady, an Ohio native who spent more than 30 years studying civil rights, race and racism. Um, she's an expert on intersectionality uh, and one of her quotes really resonated with me and I wanted to share around neurodiversity um, and, and when I linked it to something which I'm going to share with you during this presentation today around the social model of disability which I'll come on to soon. Kimberly said Intersectionality is a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality 
or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and create obstacles that often are not understood among conventional ways of thinking. That really resonated with me. And I don't think it's possible, actually, to, in my opinion, have a conversation around neurodiversity without talking about intersectionality. So how all of these things actually overlap as well as a neurodivergent person you could actually be all of the all of these many things so you know you could be straight gay black white trans neurodivergent that's intersectionality it's about all those different things and how, how all those things connect actually you know they're not just a separate isolated thing and there's over according to the united nations anyway Eight billion human beings living on the planet right now, according to the global uh, population census that the United Nations has just recently carried out. That was as of November 2022. An estimated one in four people on the planet being on the spectrum, on the neurodivergent spectrum somewhere. So my maths might be a little bit ropey, but that's around two billion billion human beings living on the planet right now who are somewhere on the spectrum um, in some capacity so it's more important than ever now to educate to understand and to empower the conversation around neurodiversity and neurodivergent talent and thinking in my opinion again neurodivergence is an equal opportunities invisible disability doesn't discriminate it cuts across boundaries like a hot knife through butter you as i said you can be black white straight gay you can be from a lower socioeconomic background or you can be middle class you can be a factory worker or a ceo doesn't care any one of us can be neurodivergent and many of us are being recognized as such every single day Is neurodiversity a disability? And I've just given a little bit of a clue to the answer there as well. But is being neurodivergent a, a disability? And I think I've already touched on some of that in what I've shared already and some of the conversations that we've been having around diagnosis, perhaps, and labels, for want of a better word. And it's a really tough question to answer, actually, um, when you think about this question. And it'll be shaped by the lived experience of that individual. Um, you could ask the two billion people that I referred to earlier on the planet right now that same question and you'll probably get a different response from each of those two billion people. Personally, I believe in the social model of disability. That's to say that disability actually is something that's created by society. Uh, and this is because disabled people, be that visible or invisible, face barriers that stop them from taking part in society in the same way as non-disabled people. And almost every neurodivergent person I've spoken to in the community or otherwise has encountered barriers, either in education, the workplace or in their personal lives. So it's not an isolated incident. So. First of all, uh, full credit for that image um, to the organisation Genius Within. There's a link there to their website. And I think what this does really well is it, it, it demonstrates the strengths of, on here it describes neural minorities, actually. So another language to get comfortable with. Um, but we're talking here about neurodivergence again and neurodivergent thinking. And as you can see from this visual, and I'm going to kind of start dropping into a little bit of acronyms here. Um, NDEAS, so neurodivergent, which is what we identify as, uh, NDEAS have a wide range of multiple co-occurring differences. I've already kind of let you in, you know. Actually, you overlap and you can be here. You can also be here. You can also be here <laughs> on the spectrum as well. Um, and as a coach myself, as a practicing coach, I very much focus on people's strengths as well. And what this does very well is articulate strengths. What's happened in the past traditionally when you've thought about 
neurodivergence and particularly in the workplace has been a heavy focus on what the challenges are. Actually focus on the strengths, focus on the strengths. And if you focus on the strengths, you can then enable people to at least have a level playing field with others. And then the strengths will far outweigh the challenges. And again, what this graphic does very nicely is it demonstrates not only the overlap between the differences, but also the strengths of each area. And this is not exhaustive, but I'll just kind of leave that just hanging just for a moment so you can kind of have a look at that and, and think about someone you might know or think about a family member who might be on the spectrum and actually focus on, and when you're having that conversation, focus on strengths always. And I think about my own challenges and I can see the overlap already here. So ADHD links into dyslexia, links into dyscalculia. But so what? With that comes one of my core values, authenticity. It also brings about creativity, verbal skills, innovation, visual thinking, 3D mechanical skills, creativity, hyper-focus, energy and passion. So there's lots of strengths within the neurodivergent mind. Playing to my strengths now as a, a visual creative thinker, some of these, particularly this, might be familiar to people. And when I'm working with clients as a, a coach, I often use images and analogies to help clients to visualize and express their own thoughts. And this can be particularly powerful when working with and supporting neurodivergent people. I really enjoy and never get tired of sharing this, this um, slide with people when I'm doing these presentations and I'm talking about this. And every time I deliver this session or a, se a session similar, I tend to get a different set of responses from people and it really intrigues me. It, drives me, it really kind of drives my curiosity actually. So let me just spend a little bit of time kind of just hanging on this slide for a moment and um, let me just, and I give you permission here, I'm going to ask you some, I'm going to ask you to do something and I give you permission to give me, you know, your honest, authentic responses here. Uh, I'm encouraging that. So, and again, no shame, but do we have any Whovians here amongst us? Do you even know what a Whovian is? <laughs> okay, so a Whovian is an ardent fan of Doctor Who. A cult-like following of Doctor Who. A, a big fan of Doctor Who. <laughs> yes, for those watching on the, uh, on, the, on the screen, there wasn't a show of hands. I would have put mine up. I'm a massive Whovian fan, so uh, yeah. Uh, no shame in admitting it. But as, as people heard of this famous blue box? Yeah, yeah, you, you know what the TARDIS is, okay. So looking at that, what do you think, and in the context of the conversation that we're having, what do you think the TARDIS might represent then in terms of the space and the conversation that we're having today and that kind of neurodivergent thinking? Anyone kind of want to put their hands up and sort of share with us what that might actually mean in terms of this context? I thought you said there were no Whovians amongst <laughs> us. Closet Whovians then, okay, okay. Yeah, no, thank you, thanks for sharing. Do I see another hand there? I would say, uh, no, I'm not a big Doctor Who fan to be put there, but I do know the uh, TARDIS is a lot yeah. bigger inside than it is outside. So when you kind yeah. of talk about neurodivergent conditions and then once you step into that world, actually there is... Yeah. It's not an infinite, but yeah. there is a... You, what I call your big ticket items. Yeah. You know, you've got that thing, and then you've yeah. got all the other smaller things, pathological demand, demand avoidance, yeah. sensory processing, mm. all those kind of things. Mm. Smaller ones, mm. but it's a big open world once you step into it. It really is. Thank you, thanks for, for sharing. And it, yeah, two more hands here. Shout out as well, because we're recording as well. I was say hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight, I like that, yeah. Mode of transportation to another world. Yeah. I'm not that big of a Doctor Who fan, but. Yeah. My understanding is it takes them somewhere else. <laughs> it's all right. I'm not I am really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really great answer. Thank you for sharing. For me, it's, it's magic. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant um, thoughts and 
feedback there and I'm not dis- I'm not going to disagree with any of that as well as, as I said I always come away from this actually with some like light bulb moments myself as well so whilst I'm sharing with you what's going on inside my head actually hearing from others what they see as well is really powerful as well actually and for me what it represents so I, I think all of that is, is great as well and I'll take that away um, it also represents my non-linear thinking um, as well it can go in any direction it isn't bound by the rules of time and space. Um, it looks smaller on the outside. Um, so moving on from the TARDIS, which I could spend a lot of time on the TARDIS, but move on, Mike, move on from the TARDIS. We've established that you like Doctor Who and the TARDIS. Okay, move on now. So the box, what do we think the box might mean then in terms of today and the conversation that we're having Again, anyone want to kind of? Sparks of creativity. Hmm. Hmm. Different directions. Yeah. 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 Hmm. We need to think outside it. Think outside the box. Hmm. Is it like opening the box as well, and then everything that sort of comes out of it? Um, yeah. In, especially in that thinking space. So. Yeah. To open the box yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I think of these answers. <laughs> Great answers. I should be writing all these down, actually. Oh, we're recording it, aren't we? So, <laughs> hey, hey, thank God for the recording. Yeah. Feel free, those watching on Catch Up, to write your answers in as well. And I can shamelessly steal those as well. So, yeah. 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 Did I see any more hands? Anyone else going to want to share anything? Yeah, so definitely the thinking outside of the box. Um, and and that's a term I'm not really that overly comfortable with, if I'm being honest with you. I think it's completely overused um, and cliched, but actually in the space of neurodivergent thinking, it's really apt, actually, because that is what we do. We do think out of the box. We don't think kind of in a linear way. And what better way is it to describe than thinking outside of the box? Um Another way I like to describe it is that kind of innovation, um, that innov- innov- innovative, get it out, Mike, innovative thinking and also thinking like an entrepreneur um, is, is probably a, a more apt and not overly cliched um, way. Finally, and no, by no means least, and I hope this is, by the way, really distracting you, if it's really distracting you, that's fantastic. That's what I wanted it to do. I hope it's really kind of like making you like, oh, what is that? What's, what's that? What's happening? So, first of all, let's start with the, 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 the poem. We've got a poet in here, Kate Jenkinson, and I hope you appreciate this poetry. Uh, very much Kate. Yeah. yeah. So, my ADHD makes it hard to focus. Focus sounds like hocus pocus. Yeah. I really like magic a lot. Abracadabra. <laughs> yeah. What do you think that means, though? Anyone? Well, it's like your brain, you say, Kate. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Uh, Share. Every, everything's an anagram for me. So I was having a conversation with someone the other day. This is a typical ADHD response to that question. Aren't Lidl and Aldi the same thing? Mm. They're the same letters if you just mix them up. So I never know when I've gone to Lidl or Aldi because when you get there, they look the same. So yeah. that's how my brain gets confused by yeah. words and how they show up. But equally, the advantage is I can create some cracking poetry like you do as well. So. And mm. it is distracting. Yeah. yeah. It's neither right nor wrong. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. There's an ADHD response. It was a brilliant one. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for sharing that as well. Um, anyone else? Rachel. That just illustrates the thought process behind, you know, somebody who's kind of starting at one point and things are evolving and evolving and evolving yeah. and making it quite difficult to concentrate on the original thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good observation. Thank you. Anyone else? I really like the rhythm of it. The rhythm? Yeah. You like the rhythm? Okay, tell so us it's, more. It's less, it's less about the words, whether you're thinking in a particular linear way or yeah. a non-linear way. Yeah it's the you've got this sort of rhythm behind what you're saying so for yeah. you it makes sense yeah regardless of what it does yeah. for other people but yeah. you know where you got to and you know how you got there yeah yeah because you've got something that you're 
Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Yeah, can feel a little bit like uh, as well. You know the little torch with the red dot that you shine at the wall and the cat sort of like yeah. jumps across all over the place as well. That can be. I was. I did contemplate using that video as well to kind of spend a day in the life of my head. Um, so my ADHD then um, means that whilst I struggle with focus uh, and have to utilize a range of tools and strategies to mitigate um, some of that. Uh, I also have the ability to hyper focus on tasks. Does that mean anything to anyone? Have you heard of hyper focus before in this context? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that as well. Yeah, thank you very much um, for that. Yeah, and hyperfocus, think focus on steroids. That That is kind of what hyperfocus is like. And um, I've had some amazing conversations with ADHDers um, about kind of hyperfocus um, and how they've been able to adapt that as a strength um, as well uh, and kind of what a neurotypical person might take weeks to accomplish with a task an ADHD when they focus can do it in a day right um, but that has to be carefully managed as well so that you don't risk burnout um, as well so it's about utilizing being self-aware enough to recognize that you've got those strengths but being able to channel it and harness it as well and I think that comes back down to then how do we do that in the workplace as well um, of course because of course they are challenges around being neurodivergent and recognizing that of course there are challenges but we can't just fit into a box that society has created for us just to kind of suit other people's expectations and yeah when you have ADHD almost everything is distracting to me um, as, as been kindly shared um, my mind is drifting off constantly thinking about other things and I'm looking for the next kind of like dopamine hit uh, and that's what drives ADHD is dopamine we're on we're like we, we charge by looking for dopamine we want dopamine hit but that needs to be mitigated and carefully balanced as well so we don't risk burnout but the world and the workplace isn't really kind of that well designed for us so of course we do need some support to navigate that but that happens through open honest and authentic conversations and when those conversations take place, you'll get the best from your neurodivergent people. Um, because what that does is that builds trust. And when you have trust, people can be their authentic selves. And make no mistake, almost all NDs have spent their lives not being their authentic selves. So, again, a few images here. And any stabs from people what any of this might mean? Again, and we're talking in visualization here as well. Does anyone kind of have any kind of thoughts about what this means in terms of neurodivergence in actions? Just guesses, just throw it out there. Cheat you are. How do I know? You're like you just read just because you're ADHD, that we can read inside my head. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's not far off the mark in, in that first guess. Okay, so uh, so well done. Uh, any uh, uh, non neurodivergent people might want to share what their thoughts are on that. Well, I don't know. I'm Good point. <laughs> I like it. great response thank you thank you yeah and again i'm going to take a lot of this away as well and think about this actually as well but yeah and just kind of sharing my sort of thoughts on that there's definitely the connection piece so there's the connecting with 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 people um whether that's one-to-one -one, whether that's kind of in teams whether that's with stakeholders peers leaders organizations 
being able to express myself to be creative, um, which I think I've hopefully demonstrated today as well. But and being able to play to your strengths, going back to the whole strength point, is really important. I can't stress how important it is to play to your strengths, particularly when you're neurodivergent as well. Um, that helps me by focusing on my strengths to help my clients, um, be that leaders or organisations, to also see things through a very different lens and a different perspective. I describe it as being a little bit like being in a helicopter and having the advantage of being able to look down uh, at a challenge or a problem and be that person or a project, a kind of helicopter view. Um, and it's through this helicopter view and through my own diversity of thought that I'm able to help my clients be the coaching clients or organizations seeking to create real and lasting inclusive cultural change to support neurodiversity in the workplace. And finally, last slide. Again, visuals and some, I like these visuals actually. I'm going to say that I'm not totally biased at all, but I really love these visuals. Um, again, don't be scared to kind of just shout out what you see here. You know, it's a bit, little bit like catchphrase. You know, what, say what you see. What, what do you think this is telling us about empowering people and, and the whole context of the conversation that we've been having today? I like that. Thank you. Is that a yeah. yeah. Mm. 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 Scary is a good word, isn't it? Ooh, neurodivergent people. Ooh. Quite scary people, or not? I think it's about stopping hiding under a sheet. <laughs> yeah. 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 Seeing, seeing that you have a strength. Yeah. And, and being able to, to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Hmm? In terms of stop ghosting people who might oh, not I like that. Listening. Ghosting people. Like yeah. Actually bring them in. Yeah. That's a great that's response. Lovely. Yeah, thank you. I've not heard that one before, but that's that's a really good one, yeah. Thank you. I can yeah. see it from a point of view of you know, we've got we've got a lot of awareness around it now, but there are gonna be a huge amount of people in the workplace that have never identified with mm. them. So it's almost like facing the fear within them mm. and not facing and not in that not that they're scared of it is sometimes you know introspection takes a lot of bravery yeah and actually they come out of that this is why i've always been like had this light bulb moment of that now my world makes sense yeah and now i can do something about it that's a, a really good answer actually and it goes back to i think and just peeling this right back to earlier on in the presentation around that whole diagnosis point as well and that can be a, a useful trigger for people to be diagnosed so that they can get that light bulb moment that eureka moment as well but here's how i kind of see it um as well uh, that was all great as well and yeah totally include all of that in, in in this and what we're saying as well but i said to everyone don't be scared of people who act and think differently from you embrace diversity of thinking and people's differences because you and your organisation will benefit from diversity of thought, innovation, creativity, energy and passion that NDAs bring to the table in abundance. Just be prepared to change yourself and your own mindset too and ask yourself, are your systems, processes and ways of working really that inclusive? Because don't forget, inclusion benefits everyone not just a few adopt a coaching habit stay curious ask open honest and authentic conversations uh, questions that build trust as i said earlier india's we don't want to be treated differently at all we want to be empowered to do our best work and by doing that benefits everybody. It's said in closing that the future of work is human-centered skills. And I know 
for the benefit of people watching this again, we've been having a conversation about this today, about the kind of future of work and what that might look like as well. But here's me adding my two penneth on, on this at this stage as well. It said that the future is wor of work is human-centered skills, such as creativity, innovation, empathy, lateral thinking. Well, again, these are all skills that neurodivergent people possess in abundance. So organizations that make that extra effort to recruit, to retain, and to nurture neurodivergent workers can gain that competitive edge now from increased diversity in skills, ways of thinking, and approaches to problem solving. My question would be, can you afford to not be taking action? My business is all built around that, Be Brilliant People Development. And I'm here to help people to make that change and to start working towards creating that neuro inclusion and building those neuro inclusive workplace cultures. And just in kind of finishing today, here's my contact details um, for the benefit of everyone watching and for the benefit of the audience here today who have given up the time, uh, which I'm very grateful of, uh, to listen to me talk about this today. If you'd like to reach out and have a conversation about how you can start your journey to supporting the development and growth of neuroinclusion and neurodivergent talent in your workplace. And please get in touch with me um, today. As I've said, there's no time to waste. If you're a neurodivergent leader who wants to work with an award-winning neurodivergent coaching leader, <laughs> thank you, to work through some of your own challenges and goals, reach out. Let's have a conversation. I can and I want to help you. So... Thank you, everyone, for your uh, attention and collaboration today and all your ideas. I've really enjoyed delivering this presentation to you. And that's it from me. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um,